Hi, uh, I'm here with the writer director of Working Man, Robert Jury, and the actors uh, Peter Garrity, who plays Allery, Talia Shire, who plays Iola, and Billy Brown, who plays Walter. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Good to see you, Claudia. Good to see you. Uh, Robert, you've written uh, such a beautiful, timely character study and an affecting elegy of, of sorts uh, to Rust Belt life and to the men and women who want nothing more than just to work um, and provide for their families. And Billy and Talia and Peter, the three of you bring so much depth and humanity to your characters. Uh, it's really wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I wanted to start with you, Robert, about what... Um, you know, was the film inspired by any particular person or particular uh, event or anything that, that triggered your writing? Yeah, well, uh, the first draft was written about 10 years ago. Um, it's been a long time in development since, but my father actually was indirectly responsible for the story. Um, I was living on a family farm in Iowa a decade ago, and my dad would, he was a retired farmer. He'd come up the road about every day and bring me the local paper, and there was a there's an article in it one day about a factory that was considering reopening after many years of, of, uh, of, of, of being abandoned. And it was actually a factory where my mother had once worked. Um, and I just sort of jokingly uh, suggested to my dad, uh, what if when they go into this factory, they find one worker there who has never stopped working despite this factory being closed all these years later and just from that little acorn of an idea the script evolved and, uh, and again over over several years uh, just developed the script it went into the film independent talent labs through their screenwriting lab and directing lab i met my producing partner clark peterson through that and and uh our our uh, producing partners Level Holder and Maya Mel came on board afterwards and then these three beautiful actors decided to lend their talents and and we we shot the movie and and you saw the results so it's it, it's it's been a it's been quite a process but I'm I'm incredibly pleased with with where we ended up well you should be it was it's interesting how um by having the story come out now, it seems so incredibly timely as unfortunately people have lost jobs and you know, in, in the wake of the pandemic, it's, uh, and yet it had been germinating for you for, for quite a while. It is, it's strange, isn't it? I mean, this, this pandemic is, has been tragic on so many levels. And um, you know, for us, it just seems like this was the story that was meeting its moment, right? After all that time, it didn't seem as though when I first had written it, that it would have much of a life beyond two or three years after I conceived that story, but um, here we are. Uh, it's it's just kind of remarkable how how time. Uh, I don't I don't know if it's if it's in our favor. I just think it's this is the time the movie was supposed to be made and seen. Yes, I want to ask all of uh, you wonderful actors uh, sort of about your characters. I'll start with Peter. Um, Allery is a man of, of very few words, and yet with every weary sigh and change in expression, you, you deliver such a wonderful performance. Um, and he's a, a simple man, but he's not ignorant. He's troubled, but he's not troublesome. Uh, and he, what was it about this particular part that, that drew you to it, Peter? I didn't have to say much. <laughs> <laughs> Not so many lines um, to learn. <laughs> line count. Yeah. Line count. No, I just, um, it, it uh, touched me on so many levels. Um, you know, there's the age old um, dichotomy and tension between the haves and the have nots in so much of theater and drama and film and, you know, we're, we're, our, so many of our stories are wrapped around, uh, around that. And it, to me, it wasn't, um, I mean, I saw the pathos and tragedy, if you were, if you would be about a man and, a, and really a, an entire town leaving, losing their, um, 
place of work, using their, losing their uh, place where they got their sustenance and their, you know, their, what kept them alive and, uh, and kept them together in a sense of community. I mean, that was an important thing uh, that they've lost when the factories close down, they lose their sense of community. And that's always been a big thing for me because that's why I got involved in the theater in the first place. 60 years ago or so, and um, it's very important to me. But but there's also that sense of the dichotomy between the haves and the have-nots. You know, everyone who lost their jobs in all of our factories around the nation, not just due to the pandemic, but due to the shifting fortunes of, of um, you know, where the corporate managers want to take us in this world. And who loses out because of it? Um, and I just think of the, all of those people like that we worked with in that in that factory, actors, yes, but bringing to life all of these characters, and they all lose their their jobs, and they lose their jobs because of some nameless group of corporate people that have decided that this is no longer a profit making uh, institution. And that kind of thing just gripes my butt. And it, and it just, and it's just really um, impactful to me. It happened to me and my family. It happened with my father. It happened with my brother. It happened with so many people that I know. Um, and now, of course, it's happening in the pandemic right and left. So that, and I didn't know about that at that, at that time, but that kind of storytelling is is very important to me. I did a, um, a couple of plays by Robert Penn Warren back in the day. I did a, 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 a play that was based on an epic poem of his called Brother to Dragons an amazing, amazing poem, and we put it on stage. And then I also played the Willie Stark character in All the King's Men. That was another thing. So we, we got to know um, Robert Penn Warren. I got to know him very well. And there's a, a, a line in Brother to Dragons where he says, I forget where it comes from, Brother to Dragons, but he says, can the hope of the heart be lost? And that line just kills me. It just touches me deeply. And so you look at all of these people that are losing their jobs, yes, but losing their identity, losing their community, losing, uh, in some cases, their family, uh, who, people who move away, people who uh, become mentally ill, people who take their lives, people who, you know, just can the hope of the heart be lost? And um, there's something about that line from years ago from Brother to Dragons with Robert Penn Warren that touched me when I read Bobby's uh, screenplay, when I read the play from Working Man. And I don't, I don't know if that comes near to answering your question. No, it does, very much so. <laughs> um, Billy, I wanted to ask you a, a similar question about what drew you to the role. There's a line where I think Allery asks Walter, you know, why are you here? And he says, where else have I got to go, I think is, is the line. And um, I thought that's, you know, that sense of purpose, like this is, this is where I have to go. I, what, what was it about your character that, that appealed to you and made you want to take part? The first, the first tangible bit was reading Walter's introduction on the porch dutifully painting the intricacies of his military figures. Bearded, cigarette dangling from the mouth, while the neighbors had scuttled butt only 20 feet away on the adjacent porch. But upon the second, third, and fourth read, the passion that Walter brought to the mission he had given himself, and he would recruit Allery to join him, which really became something that Walter put into Allery's, um, you know, control booth, into his uh, his flight deck. But the fight that Walter showed, not on behalf of himself, but on those of the factory, 
and the neighbor that he really couldn't speak much about. He doesn't really know Allery. But there were, there were echoes of familiarity in Allery's movements and what little he knew of the, of the missing, the longing, the loss that was seeping from Allery that Walter could pick up on. And because of Walter's, uh, you know, type one bipolar disorder, um, whether he could articulate it linearly, Walter, instinctually he knew there was a kinship between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And reading Walter, I could see this is a guy who would go after what he wanted to go after, irrespective of the repercussions or the tides against, you know, his every move. So that was, uh, it was exciting. Yeah, it's a very layered character, and, yeah. and you played it so well. Thank you. Thank there's, a, there's a moment where, um, where Walter um, intuits that Allery somehow needs to drive the truck. <laughs> and I, I never could figure out how Walter knew that, but he knew it. And I never even figured out why Allery was afraid to or couldn't or whatever. But with Allery one motion, he says, <laughs> he says, why don't you drive the truck? No, 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 I, I can't drive the truck. He says, yeah, yeah, here. And he tosses the keys up in the air and they, you know, land in my hand or something. And I'm going like, Hell, shit, I'm driving the truck now. <laughs> and it's just kind of amazing, you know, because it, it's about what, Billy just said about him be, being in, so intuitive about what the relationship is and what what hour he needs and how and how it, it you know he identifies that. Yeah. And Talia, you had something to add to that too about that. What well, I felt so interesting is that Walter did intuit that this was. This was Allery's moment because Allery really had never been that guy ever he in his entire career at the at the factory he had not he'd been that simple guy who had lunch went home but he'd never been that guy and so what's so fascinating to me in the piece is that walter walter knows it and he makes allery emerge right in order to emerge then allery is able to mourn his own child i mean it's a curious curious journey that's set in motion very by the healing presence of Walter, who's unique, you know, very unique <laughs> in this piece. So, how does it feel, Robert, to hear everyone, uh, you know, sort of describing the nuances of the characters that you wrote? Um, that must feel good. It it does, you know, and and to touch on what what Peter was saying and and what what Billy's uh, what Walter's intuitions might have been you know i always felt like um you know he would he would know he would the again that scuttlebutt that he would hear from around the neighborhood he would know details about what happened to um allery and iola's son he would he would know things um whether we see that on camera or not it, it's just a part of be, living in small town life um it's it's kind of like an office environment if you've never lived in a small town there's uh, the gossip and and hubbub spreads pretty fast so i would imagine that he would have he would have known about the circumstances of their son's death and that it involved a vehicle uh an automobile and and that reason would it would just make the idea for allery so difficult to to drive again and i think walter would know that i think walter would understand that that's one of those things that he's whether consciously or or not, helping him clear one of those hurdles, one of those emotional hurdles, and as Talia expressed, helping him become something, you know, become that leader that he's never been his entire life. Um, he's always been a guy in the background, um, more than willing to let other people lead. And um, it's, and uh, you no, know, I, I, but I, I love hearing their, their impressions of the work, you know, especially now this this much time removed from when when we made the movie. Tali, I wanted to ask you, uh, your work is so subtle and so moving, and you know, we we've seen 
women like Iola, where it's a woman behind the man who's nurturing and she's holding in her own pain, but she's also grounded and dealing with things in her own way, kind of separately. Um, what drew you to that role? Did you draw upon any people that you knew in a way to sort of create her? Well, if you were to read this piece on the page, uh, I kept turning the pages, waiting for Allery to say something. And he does it, he's on and on. And I thought, wow, this is the most fascinating, this guy's in purgatory. So what drew me to it was the audacity, the audacity of the piece to say, this man isn't gonna talk for a long time. And, and on top of it, on top of the loss, premature loss of a factory closing down is the, is the suicide of a child. Those two things to put together to me were, I was amazed by it. That's what drew me to it. How do you play this? How do you make this thing work? Then the casting happened, right? And that's always magical. That Peter, in all those walks that you took in the beginning of the, there's always a, a sweetness of soul there, right? And then Billy has this kind of crazy beauty you know, to support you. So I, what drew me to the piece was all of these things, the writing, the time, the place, and the actors. I'm gonna give you a crazy quote from, from F Freud, of all people. Ready for this one? <laughs> for a person to be happy, he needs a job and to be loved. That's what you need. But right now in this moment in time, we need an education because a lot of our jobs are gonna be changed by artificial intelligence and so forth. But that's what you need. You need to wake up in the morning and you need to come home and go to bed with someone you love. And there was something uh, here in this piece where this man was going to work in pain and they were going to bed together uh, with great pain. So does that sort of? Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting because I was reading a book recently about this Japanese philosophy called Ikigai, which is about having a sense of purpose. And that's why a lot of Japanese people live very long and fruitful lives. They don't retire. They don't even have a word for retirement. They just talk about the sense of purpose. And it doesn't necessarily mean like going to a job, but it means a, a sense of you know, fulfillment and doing something that matters to you. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's at the heart of who uh, these characters that you need to have a sense of meaning or purpose in your life. And uh, I loved the way, you know, they regained that by the two of them together, you know, in their efforts. Um, of them because what was so wonderful is I'm in the, the home part, right? And Walter is in the factory part, but they're all one extraordinary experience that's taking place to get, there's a kind of wonderful collaboration that begins to include the whole town. And that's, e even the disillusionment of the town is fascinating to see, because they did have some, some victory, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what do, what do you think it is, um, and I guess this is mostly for Peter and Billy, so for so many men, work is that reason for living. I mean, you mentioned work and love, but um, it becomes a replacement for, for life. And, and in the case of uh, Allery's character, I mean, he used work to block out emotional trauma. Mm -hmm. um, do you know people like that? And what, what is it, do you think, about men particularly that, that struggle with this? Me? No, I'm going to ask the men. Oh, <laughs> yeah, ask the men. I, or I can ask any, anybody who wants to answer. <laughs> I don't know about um, about what about you, Billy? I don't know about Billy. I don't know. Yeah. All, all I all I know is I started working when I was thirteen, took a five year break, came back when I was nineteen, and uh, haven't stopped. But it, I don't know what I would do if I stopped. I don't know what I would do, or who I would be. The only thing I know is that. The only thing other than continuing to pursue some understanding of what it means to be a human being is that, uh, and, the story, and the stories that illuminate that, the only other thing that I know, which is a pretty big thing, 
is that I have three children, one grandson and a wonderful who has a wonderful wife, and two great grands of five and two. August is five, Alma is two. And I'm with them now. They're out there somewhere. And, uh, you know, and God, oh, my God, thank God I got that. You know, because mm. uh, I ain't doing all that much working anymore. But <laughs> I got that. And it just seems to me that Allery, yeah, the loss of the job, I don't see it so much as a loss of identity. It's a loss of what to do when I wake up in the morning and I don't have anything to do. And so I got to go and break in to that factory and I got to get a bottle of Windex and start cleaning, cleaning off the machines and fixing little flashlights to my eyeglasses or whatever. I got to do that stuff because I don't have anything else to do. But I don't have anything else to do because I don't know how to express the loss of love that happens to me, that happened to me when I lost that boy. When I lost that boy. I don't know how to express that. Right. And so I go to work because that keeps it at bay. And I don't, I don't understand why Iola can't see that, can't, or she does see it, and I don't know how to reach out, and I don't have it within me to reach out and say, you know, let's share this, and we'll get through this together, and that kind of thing. I don't have it in me. I just, I just know I got to keep walking, mm. go to the grocery store, and, and buy, go to the store, hardware store, or whatever, and buy stuff to clean the machines with. And and then this guy over here throws a, a set of car keys in my direction and uh, helps me break into the dam. And I don't even know what the hell he's doing. He's he doesn't know my son, but it's true. What Billy said, you know, or or maybe Robert said, you know, the the scuttlebutt around the neighborhood. You can't you can't escape that. And I'm thinking it, it's kind of like the three witches. You know the three witches are 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 there and they're 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 twenty feet away from from Walter and they're stirring the pot and he's just I see him over there and he's just listening listening what the hell are they saying now look he's he ain't one for this world he's they're gonna grab they're gonna grab that sucker he should be in a mental institution. <laughs> It's just a ner it's just interesting, you know, it's so it's so complex and and the humanity of it just leaps out and smacks you in the nose. You know, I would just add to that, you know, I as as I got to know Peter from the time that he arrived on, on set, got to know a little bit more about um just his working life in general and how he, he was saying he he had never really stopped in those convert and he's he's brought this up. I don't know if even Peter's aware of this himself, but he's brought it up numerous times when we've had conversations like this or other places. Um, and it, it's why I, I, I think he has, again, whether Peter realizes this or not, he has a deep reservoir to pull from just portraying this character because there is so much that he can identify with as, as a person who has never stopped working and has a real desire and a need to to keep working. Am I off base, Peter? Is no, that not at all. Not at all. Not yeah, at all. I, I, I it's, be, they've got, there's going to be this pine box at one point, you know, <laughs> and I would just assume the pine box is included in whatever the last piece of storytelling that I do. I, I, I don't want to, what's the, what's the point of stopping? I mean, I, I, I cannot, all I can do is come and tell stories to my grandkids. I wish little August would come running out here right now because I tell, I told him stories today. I tell him stories every time I can. And he knows me now as I try not to 
for the bar the tears, except he knows me now as Grandpa tells, Grandpa tells stories. And and the other day, I was trying to describe to him uh, that I happen to like bananas that have dark spots on them. And uh, my daughter was saying, well, I can't handle them. It's too sweet. They're too mushy and everything. I like those yellowy green firmer bananas and i go on about how much sugar content and i happen to like the ones with the dark spots and i'm going on and on about it and finally august who's five says just drop it grandpa <laughs> drop it <laughs> just eat the banana <laughs> and that's kind of the message of the movie right just this ability to move on right it's uh, clear, clearly we have the uh the, the right actors for the roles who's <laughs> <laughs> dropping <laughs> well Tommy, it's all about it's all about love it's yeah. all about love everything's about love who you have in your life who did Walter lose when he lost that incredibly beautiful woman? And 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 who are Viola and I in the process of losing? Who mm. did we lose? But who and what danger are we in of losing the person who is lying next to you in the bed? And so as as Talia says. You know, Billy becomes a, 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 a salvation, I don't know how you put it, a salva an angel. A, he was a, a, angelic. An angelic yeah. character. Yes. You know, who flies above those three witches who are on the next porch. <laughs> and somehow, you know, saves us in some crazy way. I and I, I, I wish I had brought with me, but I didn't. I left it back in New York, but I stole a, one of those little blue figures that, that Walter created. One of those little, little, little work. Did you get any of those, Walter? <laughs> no, I left them. I left them for Bob. Oh. <laughs> you left Air them package Bob. in your future. <laughs> you got to send them one. Well, mine's on the desk, my desk in New York, and you ain't getting it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the scene between um, between Walter, or not Walter, I'm sorry, between Allery and Iola, where they're talking about the grief. And, and she says, he needed you to talk to him. And he says, I was providing for him because that's how he felt that he was doing his best. And those seem, those were heartbreaking. I wondered how hard those might've been to film and if you had rehearsed beforehand, or how, I know you guys are all professionals and been doing this for a long time. so. How do you, but those are tapping into some very deep emotions. How do you get to that place? I, I, I felt that at that moment, and Iola is declaring herself in the marriage, which is that she needs to live because she's had this great loss and that she hasn't been alive, they haven't been alive, and she can't, she, she, she can't do that to her son. So it was a declaration of we're going to live or so that 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 had a little rhythm to it that that they have. It's an interesting thing. You know, suicide. This is something Robert put in the movie, which is actually fantastic to add. I mean, not fantastic, wonderful, but amazing that you added a suicide. You know, really is no matter what we think or say, it still has great stigma. Uh, mm -hmm. And that this couple right in front of you were dealing with this kind of loss, whether they would mm -hmm. go forward or not. And if they could go forward, that would be a whole new relationship with Walter. That's what's so extraordinary, how these parts were braided together, just braided it, Walter, loss of, I mean, loss of the factory, and it all worked. You know, it all worked. But you, 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 the speech had in it the possibility that maybe that was going to be it. She would leave. Yeah, it was a turning point. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I love the way you describe the braiding because that is what life is really. You know, it's a piece of this, a piece of that, and you put it together and that's the patchwork mm -hmm. of your life. Um, and you captured that so well, Robert. Um, and in some ways, this feels like a coming of age film too because men are reaching that, that sort of, 
second act, there's a difference in their age, but still they're, they're dealing with, you know, what's my next move? And that's coming of age. Sure. See it that way? Um, yeah, I mean, they have, they have to deal with it from the first scene, right? Where they lose their jobs, their security, what they think they knew and they could um, count on. So now what? Um, they're, they're kind of the last of the, the holdouts of this, this small factory town, and, and it's, it's slowly disappeared out from under them. And I, I don't know, I, having come from communities like this, I, I grew up near factory towns in the Midwest, and um, I, I saw that firsthand from family members and friends who've had to deal directly with job loss and, and you know, what are we going to do? I mean, I think a lot of people right now are going through that, that very mm -hmm. thing. It's, it's uh, just the, the sign of our times. And I mean, we're hopeful. I, I'm ho very hopeful what can happen, um, not just for our country, but for the manufacturing sector in, in particular. But yeah, these characters are certainly dealing with uh, that growth, right? The stage of and, and questioning how how do we respond how do we um how do we grow as people beyond this and and i i think a lot of it talia has said this before when we've had conversations so much of it depends on community right and those people around you that will help whether whether the reasons are you know maybe as altruistic or not in in walter's case but that that rallying together of people under one cause it's 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 pretty powerful i think and and we need maybe stories like this to help us through times like we're in yeah because we're you know we're all in our little pods and it's hard mm -hmm. to feel that sense of rallying together and then you have the country being so divided and right we need stories like this i think particularly now i heard that um where you shot the plant that you shot at the mccray manufacturing plant actually closed late last year that's an interesting 70 years have been uh working on plus effective 70. Mm -hmm. wow wow in, uh, december of last year wow yeah, it was, and it's actually um, the last conversation we had with uh, Brian Miller, who is a uh, really great gentleman, who is the the plant manager there, and helped so much with with Billy and Peter in particular, with <laughs> helping them run the machines and being kind of a consultant on set. He he was telling me that, um, as Billy said, the the factory closed a year after we wrapped. Um, in strange set of circumstances and and they're they're facing demolition right now that that mm -hmm. that very factory is is probably going to be demolished this month from from the last news that i had why the hell is that why is that you mean we still use plastics yeah i mean, uh, I mean that thing billy was saying the other day that thing that factory made you just need to retool the machines these giant machines the size of trucks and and just toss the plastic raw plastic in the top of it, and you retool the 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 the, the machine, and out comes whatever you want to have come out. And so I remember what I was working on was coming out those little reflectors that go on the back of toy or bicycles or toys or cars or whatever, so they pick up lights and they reflect them. But we still need all that stuff. Where's that all gone over there? I don't understand why. Why, why, Billy said they made the cup holders with the phones and everything. So yeah. yeah, you're asking the same questions that I think the, the characters in our film are asking. Why is, why, is the, why is a job or why does this factory have to close? I think the answers aren't easy or they're probably just not one. You know, there's many factors, whether it's competition globally in that marketplace. I mean, I, strangely enough, the in the screenplay, it's written to be shot in a plastics injection molding factory, just as where where we shot it. And that was largely because I knew someone that had a factory like that. And it, it kind of set up nicely for who these characters were and how you could kind of be um, alone, but together within that, that working environment. But he mm -hmm. told me that um, so much of that industry in particular uh, was dying 
you know, for, again, for numerous factors, just automation, uh, mm. competition from overseas, or even just competition from your, well, I think your those neighbors. Machines they're making now. I mean, there, there's a lot of it's artificial intelligence or ro robots, I guess. Mm. Yeah, automation as much as even global here? competition is is uh, is is challenging the manufacturing sector. Yeah, yeah it's tough sure. to compete when uh, you know wages and labor and uh, labor laws don't exist in foreign markets of production. It's yeah, yeah. right. There, there's there's a lot of economics. I mean, we can do better here to protect our own workforce. Um, I always think if the factory is able to stay a little bit ahead with a little more innovation, as Talia said, more education towards what we need accomplished tomorrow, mm -hmm. rather than holding on to how we did things yesterday, then you, you don't run the risk of becoming as obsolete as so. So your viability stays where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And the re-education of your ground force, as well as the, uh, the corporate side, allows that company to to be more nimble. Yeah, exactly. there, was, there was that documentary last year that won the Oscar American Factory. Remember that? And yeah. it was, you know, again, it was, you know, the laws were different in China, and then when they came, oh. people, it was just a different, different practices. Well, and different hour. Indeed. Um, my brother Augie, who knew everything, said that when World War II, when everything was destroyed in Germany and Japan, I think the Marshall Plan. We, the Americans went in and retooled their factories. Mm -hmm. so these became great factories, right? So it's a kind of retooling here. And I believe with education, we can blossom here. You don't have to go overseas. We can do it here. But it's, it's, the answer with most of the things today will be education. Right. You have to invest some money to get the education, and a lot of people are not willing to invest the money and all of that. So, oh, okay. yeah. 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 Um, so, so next on Frontline, Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all be there, Claudia. We'll all be there. <laughs> Good. We can discuss this. <laughs> was your film really made in 20 days? Is that true? It was. It wow. was. Actually, uh, in that factory, we were reminded. Um, just a day ago, Level Holder, one of our producing partners, I think we were only in that factory for about six, six full days in that factory. In the, but we were 19 days in the Norwich, Illinois area, which is an uh, incorporated town surrounded by Chicago. And um, then one day, our last day, down in Joliet, which is a, a big manufacturing town. And most of the exteriors that you saw, the, the beautiful bridges, the draw bridges with the grain barges and uh, all of Peter's walking seats. <laughs> he, he must have walked 20 miles on that last yeah. day. Uh, I've walked back and forth and across. Back and forth. <laughs> I know Joliet better than Joliet knows Joliet. That's, that's right. He, he, he took the part because, because there were few lines, but he didn't know how much walking would be involved ultimately. So, but yeah, it was, it was a, it was, <laughs> there was, maybe not a fair one, but um, yeah, 20, 20 days of which Peter was there every day of because he's in about every scene. And, and then uh, Billy and Talia sort of overlapped at some periods when, when, when they came to set. But I have to say, it, um, they, they really did a beautiful job, I think, coming together with this, this, a film like ours. You don't have much, much in the way of rehearsal time or anything like that. But they came together and just quickly formed a um immediate chemistry i thought um not just with themselves but our chicago cast who was great um mm -hmm. so well, of course we're waiting for the sequel Bob. <laughs> yes we're all waiting <laughs> working man two still walking <laughs> <laughs> walking man huh walking man. <laughs> perfect i was always afraid bob was going to ask me to jump off that bridge in julia <laughs> But I'd only add the idea. <laughs> it's in the sequel. Right, that's right. That's the sequel, right. <laughs> um, did you use any actual factory workers in, in background scenes or anything, or were those all actors that we saw? No, there, there were some, some factory we're, We were working around their schedule, honestly. Um, we did a, a five-day work week where uh, we had 
at least in the factory, we had the weekends to ourselves, but those other days, they, we had split time with them and sometimes that would overlap, right? Where we, they'd be on one end of the factory doing their thing and we'd be making the film on the other side. So um, yeah, you'll, you, you'd see several folks that, from, that, from that factory. And I, I think, um, fortunately, Brian Miller, the manager, was able to find them work. Uh, most everyone, as I understand, work uh, as the factory closed down, the, the actual factory. So that was a bit of a silver lining story as yeah. Yeah. We, they were otherwise, you know, dealing with some pretty sad news. Yeah. What a great guy. I would like to ask Talia a question. Is, I just what? wanted to, Robert, you go. are they going to knock down the building of the factory? That's you... my understanding. Yeah, they'll, they'll demolish it in, in uh, making way for, the oh. next thing, right? Retail, what what have you? Wow! I, I think Peter had a question for you. Peter, sorry, Claudia. It's, it's, That's I, okay. This is the way it works. Uh, uh, they just take control. Like, and <laughs> oh, this is a this is a silly question, but the yes, uh, the other day when we did one a session like this, a Zoom session, uh, Talia had her computer turned in a different way. So on that day we got a different picture of half of that painting with the dogs that's over your shoulder. Now I'm getting the whole thing. <laughs> uh, before, the other day I only got the left side of it. Now I'm getting the right <laughs> side of it. Now finally I can see the whole thing. Tell me the story about that. Is there a story? That's Sarah Bernhard. This is why Bill uh, has no nothing in the background, so nothing will be distracted. <laughs> good. Well, what's the story of that painting? Yeah, I know uh, there's a story. The story is my brother gave me this painting, and it's a great copy of a very famous painting of Sarah Bernhardt. Interesting, uh, isn't it? That's a, it. Doesn't look like Sarah Bernhardt, but that is Sarah Bernhardt. In the white. Huh? In the white, that's Sarah Bernhardt? <laughs> yeah, she's all sitting there with her dogs. Oh, it's so cool. Uh, and that is Sarah Bernhardt, right. First that's the sweet thing about Zoom, is that we're, we're all admiring everybody's backgrounds, I think. Oh, and right. 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 I'm, always trying to read, I'm always trying to read the titles on people's books. Me too. In their, in their book <laughs> the only one who gets away with uh, out having any of that is Billy, because he's got the... Uh, Friend of the, I know where you're sitting in front of Billy. Who? <laughs> That's right. I know. I know. <laughs> um, so I want to ask as a final question, we'll wrap it up, but I want to ask you all, what was the biggest challenge for each of you, including Robert, but particularly the actors, in making this film? Uh, well, I can hop in first, if that's okay. okay. Um, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm the first time director, so it was it was all daunting from the beginning but um, you, you start to get your feet underneath you a little bit and and when you really when you have the support like I did with my, my producing partners and these three actors and everyone else involved um, I don't know that there was any one thing that was the most challenging I think it was all sort of one giant tidal wave of of fear going into it for me and and ultimately on the other side now that that we're here um, I'm just so elated, really. I'm and proud of it, and grateful to these people because of what they um, gave of their talents. Yes, um, which is obvious to anyone who sees the movie. But just the type of people that you're seeing here today, um, quality people, and it's that's that's what I hope we all. I mean, that's what we all hope for. I think in our working lives and personal lives is to be able to work with with special folks that, uh, you know, I, I'll be pestering them probably for my lifetime. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's just a sense of appreciation more than anything. But I'm, I'm sure they have their own personal stories and, 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 and things they could tell you about that were, were challenges. But I, I really have nothing but gratitude. Well, getting a passion project off the ground, we all know that that is not an easy thing to do. So. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah in this world that's a it's a tough one of the biggest for me would be uh 
aside from tackling the material, the density of it, was coming back at odd hours um, to the Intercontinental and having them say, sorry, Mr. Brown, room service is closed. But we can send up a couple of heads of romaine lettuce and let you fish to a lobster tail. <laughs> That's a rough, rough life. Rough <laughs> life, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I guess, I guess, honey, do you want to go? Okay. I think the hardest, the challenge for me, Peter, Robert, Billy, was saying goodbye to all of you. Mm. I, that, I, I, I felt great and continue to feel love for these people. Okay, the hardest thing for me, and I have to say this is the truth, um, to Robert and to Billy and to Peter was saying goodbye. I didn't, I, um, I just came to love my fellow actors. I mean, I really loved, loved these people, loved going to work with, with these people. Peter, how about you? Uh, well, I adore you, Talia. I like you a lot, Billy. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> this is the both of you. <laughs> I won't leave you. I, I think. I think for me, it was just uh, the whole process of, you know, you know that all events of your past or the past affect and and uh, shape all events of the present and of the future. And, and knowing, you know, trying to figure out what the events of Allery's life in the present are one thing because they're being imposed on him. What are the events of the future going to be is a mystery. but. To me, I think the challenge was trying to think about and feel what the events of the past were that shape and affect these present and future, whatever the present and future is going to be. So that entails everything. That entails my meeting with Iola, that entails my love of Iola, that entails my love of, of Gabe, our son, and then the, the loss of that son, and the subsequent, you know, taking the plug out of the drain of the bathtub of Iola, Allery and Iola's relationship, and then the loss of the factory. And, uh, to me, the loss of the factory is very, very important, but it's less important in a way of like, what the hell has happened to my life, uh, given that my son did that? And what responsibility do I bear? And what responsibility do I bear with this woman that I, that I love? And, you know, it's, uh, it's just the thing that I think actors all go through when they're trying to figure out where, where do I come from, what do I need, what do I desperately need, and how can I possibly get it? Uh -huh. And it's only through the intercession of, of Walter and that, and that maelstrom that we go through that I am able to find some kind of peace with what Gabe went through and reconnect with my wife, you know. And uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't think that's very well articulated, but it's an emotional thing that actors go through no matter what you know, do Samuel Beckett or are you doing Shakespeare or whatever the hell you're doing? Are you doing Bobby Jury? You're, you're looking for what the meaning, what, it, what does it mean to be a human being? 
beautifully put. Yeah, very beautifully. And it shows your film had so much to say about grief and about addiction and mental illness. I mean, really, and joblessness. I mean, really, really important issues. Yeah. Um, you know. So many, you know, Claudia, right now, as we can all agree, with all of our normal and comfortable routines having been flipped on not just their head, but back on their side and then pulled apart and reassembled by some force behind a uh, veil. The frailties in each every one of us, the family units are more exposed than they ever have been. So if there is mental illness, it is expressed to a far greater degree now. Uh, the loneliness, um, maybe some have the joy they didn't have. So there's a lot of those, um, those visceral emotions that are at the surface and extremely heightened. Mm -hmm. And Bob's, uh, you know, Bob's movie touches on, on, on a lot of those themes um, yeah. through, through the expression of his writing and our uh, portrayals. Absolutely, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a good note to, to wrap up on here. And now I'm facing the challenge of having to say goodbye to all of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you, Claudia, for having us. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Peter, Talia, and Billy. This has been great. Really Thanks, great. Thank you. Thank you.